and I'm just really happy to see so many faces here, especially faces of my best friend from childhood all the way to my friends as an adult. So it's wonderful. And then everyone that I'm meeting for the first time now. So thank you for joining us tonight, this evening. This is the beauty of virtual um, programming is that we could have people from all over the globe in one place. So I'm gonna share my um, screen with you. Okay. So um, the, the title of my lecture is Uncovering Histories While Making Art, right? right? So um, here's a quote. There is a thing passing in the sky, some thick clouds surround it. The uninitiated sees nothing. This quote is a Mende quote, which is from my um, grandmother's heritage, my paternal grandmother's heritage. And I really, this quote really stands out to me because in Mende culture, they're thinking about understanding the culture and how you have to understand the culture in order to grow into the culture. But for me, this is e this even extends to how we see ourselves. And I think about the duality of living in a space where you must understand oneself in order to thrive in the space. Because if you don't get an understanding of yourself, then you define yourself by how others see you. So I like this quote and this duality and how we could have multiple meanings about how much we actually know. And how much do we know that is coming from a self-exploration versus what is placed on our bodies? I'm really inspired by the work of Sylvia Arden Boone. And I'll tell you a quick story about how this book came into my practice. I was at my studio in Col at Columbia University and a very brilliant artist named Susan Susanna Kofi, who's a painter, she came in and she saw actually one of these masks in my room, which I had from the first time, well, the second time that I traveled to Sierra Leone back in 1992. And I had these things in my studio as a way to just inspire me as I was thinking about tapping into my culture to make work. And she said to me, she said, Delphine, you need to have this book by Sylvia Arden Boone. And, you know, she was going on about Sylvia Arden Boone is actually the first African American to uh, be tenured at Yale University and her seminal work on Mende culture is so, so, so amazing. And so right after that meeting, I had another meeting in the same week with Dr. Kelly Jones, who is a renowned professor of African art. And in that meeting, she said, Delphine, you know, we're talking about my work. She said, I have a book for you. And she handed me this book all within the same week. And this is how my, my life works. My life is definitely based on serendipity when one thing leads to another. And it was at that point, I knew I was in the right direction. Here are some other books that I'm inspired by from um, Robert Ferris ha um, Thompson, Flash of the Spirit, who also worked with Sylvia Arden Boone, Edouard Glissant, um, Michael Gomez. So many of these books are really talking about the long relationship between Africa and its diaspora. And that re that's really what drives my work, this connection. Here are some of the authors that I've been inspired by. I, it's, it's really interesting because people say, who inspires you? And, and the first thing that comes to my mind, even before I think about other artists, I'm really thinking about writers because I think about my work as language making and I really, I'm tapping into the language and the research of these artists and they translate into the visual works that I create. Here's a piece that I made. Um, I'm named after my grandmother, Adama, and this is my grandmother here. And this picture is the one thing that connected me to her as I was in my Brooklyn home growing up and she was miles, thousands of miles away in Sierra Leone. And so I think it's called Mende Uman and Uman means woman. And I think about how this idea of me looking at her and she's looking at me and this exchange between our spirits because she is an ancestor now. But there's also so much more about the repetition and the patterns, which really, as I, you just, as I discuss my work further, you see that I'm very much inspired by repetitions and patterns. My grandmother worked with her hands to make batik fabrics. And these are two of her original fabrics that she made. And I have tons of them. Even the dress that I'm wearing now, this dress is older than me. And my mom once wore it. And this fabric is something that she actually hand dyed by hand. So what I found myself doing is this way of connecting with her. Some of these fabrics have lived with me for years. And some of them were my mom's. And then they got, you know, and now they're with me. 
And I think about her pattern making, I think about her language making through fabric. And I take that same process as I make my work. And sometimes I'm actually scanning in her fabrics or collecting fabrics that were made in a similar fashion and including that in the work. And this leads me to um, my series, The Sacred Star of Isis. I wanna read this passage because this really um, expresses what, where I'm coming from with this art that I'm making. It is, a very, it is very important to note that Africans who survived the Middle Passage were physically and spiritually the strongest of the race. They arrived in the new world not only as resistant triumphs to the unnameable horrors done to the human body and spirit in the castle and ships, but also as living, thinking embodiments of ritual, medicine, medic medicinal, agricultural, political, music, artistic, organizational, philosophical ideas and knowledges from old and complex cultures in Africa, such as the Yorubas, the Igbos, the Iwe, the Dogon, the Wolof, the Zulu, the Kikuyu, among many others. While their captors thought that these Africans were mere properties, acquisitions with an extraordinary capacity for manual labor and an unprecedented cap capability to adapt or acc acclimize to a hostile landscape, the Africans as history came to reveal were, were actually mobile libraries of their culture's total intelligence. I, this really resonates with my practice because I think about how all of this knowledge in the new in this new world, as it was called, translated into the intellectual um, <laughs> the interest intellectual expression that lived through the bodies of the Africans that were brought here. So even if we think of all in of this space that we call America and all of the contributions that Africans have contributed to this space and around the um, the diaspora. And just thinking about how that lives on, if we think about just musical expression, we could go to the spiritual, to the to gospel, to the blues, to jazz, and it could go on and on and on. And that idea of language making, of intuitive language making that lives in the body and continues to live and express and evolve, it goes to this point that even though these horrific systems were meant to annihilate our bodies and erase our cultures, we insist there's potential and we continue to live and thrive despite of. And that leads me to passageways, secrets, traditions, spoken and unspoken truths or not. I think about that living in the continuum, how much is passed on from generation to generation? How much is, what are the secrets that are not meant to be shared? What are the pass? what goes through our bodies? What is the information and what do we share? And I also think about the histories that we, um, that we are learning. How do we interpret these um, histories? How do we start to uncover the histories that were shielded to stop our progression? Here is a photograph um, that I took with my mom, actually. I, this is one of the few photos in which she performs with me. And I'm thinking about so many different things within this frame. The border is actually a fabric that my grandmother hand dyed. And the dress that I'm wearing is also a dress that she hand dyed. My mother wore it as a young person. And now I'm embodying the dress. And I perform often in this dress. I don't feel like it goes with one particular frame, but it's about retelling and telling and the retelling of the story. Here's another one with my godmother. It was important for me to, to be in these positions with people who were older than me, passing on knowledge, but also thinking about the exchange of knowledge. With my um, grandmother's fabrics, I also found myself sampling her fabrics and continuing to rep rep um, replicate the patterns, the layers. So this idea of repetition, I'm quoting Edouard Glissant here. Repetition, moreover, is an acknowledge is an acknowledge from of consciousness both here and elsewhere, consenting to an infinitesimal momentum. In addition, perhaps unnoticed, that stubbornly persist in our knowledge. And again, that continuum is what is stubbornly persist persisting in our knowledge: the the will to live and to evolve. Oops. Okay, body vernacular is thinking of that same idea. Here I'm taking different fabrics. I think a lot to my memories of being a child and having wallpaper in my living room and thinking about the idea of these languages that are meshing against each other, right? So we have the body that is covered in a tradition, in an African dyed fabric 
um, then going against, you know, juxtaposed against this fabric that comes from a different culture. And I'm, I'm constantly shifting and putting these um, fabrics against each other, even the hair. And the this series is called Body Vernacular, where I'm thinking about making new languages with the body. And again, many of these fabrics are either collected, stamped in the same way that my grandmother used, or I'm using her fabrics within them. But it's very interesting. I'm really interesting in the idea, interested in the idea of language making. And some of the body gestures are recognizable and some are not. Which leads me to the cleanse. This is my actually my first video piece. And it, I was so happy to have it exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum over the summer as a, as well, actually this fall as a public art piece. So for a whole um, month, this was on rotation outdoors and open for the public to see. And the, the process of making this video was definitely inspired by, again, this long continuum of expression of language of intelligence that lives through our body and I represented that by patterning and also having take it sampling like sampling trap music juxtapositioning it against um, traditional Mende chants that call for the um, the harvest again and sampling the words of a tra of trap musicians calling for the rain and of course I'm taking things out of context to make its new language so the stop the track was actually constructed in one way and the, um, the visuals are actually constructed in another way. Throughout this whole process, you see my hair transforming and that's also thinking about that transformation, the evolving throughout history and time. So I'll play a sample for, for um, of it for you. <laughs> And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And he who sent down from time to time water from the sky in due measure, and we raise to life therewith a land that is dead, even so will you be raised from the dead. There is neither time nor place for us here unless we create it. I found God in myself and I loved her. I found God. I loved her fiercely. I loved her. I loved her fiercely. This video is normally 10 minutes and 23 seconds, but I had to show you a short version. Mm -hmm. 
I think of the video as an extension of photography and a way of breaking the frame of photography. Um, here's an installation that I had at the at, um, during my solo show at Hess Plateau, which is my gallery. And what you're looking at is on one side wall where you see the mixed media. Um, that piece is made from raffia that, that's from Sierra Leone, sea moss from Savannah, pieces of my grandmother's fabric, sage. It's, a, it's, a diff, it's all combined of all of these different elements, which is another way that I'm using materials now as sampling these different materials in order to make something new. And then the video projection is, a, I'm going to play a sample of that video and it's called Deep Inside I'm Blue. And in this video, I'm sampling life up around the diaspora. So you'll see elements of Argentina, of Nigeria, of um, Sierra Leone, of New York, all these different places that I've, I've been to. Every time I travel, it's almost like the world and the spirit of the world is speaking to me. And there's a need to collect different samples of this expression. And I'll play a little bit of this for you. And even with that film, it's um, the, the voice that you're hearing is, is from myself sitting down with a, a person who grew up in the house with my grandmother. So in 2017, I visited um, Sierra Leone again, and I got to talk to her and interview her. And the song that she's singing is a, one of my grandmother's favorite songs that is a seasonal song for, um, you know, a celebration song. So she wanted me to hear that. And it was important to have her voice, her, it's almost like a storytelling, her voice as the, the background to this diasporan view. With this series that you're looking at here, I'm working in assemblage as well. And it's kind of another progression for me where I wanted to feel the materials. So rather, this is almost like the way that I'm approaching video, I'm approaching materials and piecing materials together. I named this one, Here We Are Energy Mass Life, based on Octavia Butler's um, um, words. Here we are, energy mass life, shaping life, mind shaping mind, God shaping God, consider, we are born not with purpose, but with potential. Here I am returning again to, again to that idea of potential. And here's another piece. The face on this is also a mixture of all of these materials that I'm getting from different parts of the globe. I think a lot about masking in my work and the power of masking and what is unseen and what is unknown and the power in the unseen and the unknown. And it's interesting because even through looking at these works, I start to learn different things over the years as I revisit them. 
curtains and fabrics are something that I'm definitely attracted to when I'm making these works. Um, interestingly enough, this was taken in, taken in Sierra Leone. And the first time that I went to Sierra Leone, I was four years old. And the one memory that I have are of those curtains. So in these spaces that I choose to photograph when I am in Sierra Leone, I'm thinking about the colonial structures that were um, present during the time of my mom's childhood. And, and but then the, 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 the tension between the indigenous bodies of a space and this colonial structure that is running a space. I'm also thinking about the idea of how one form of um, culture and spirituality tra traveling throughout the diaspora. And so I take on the embodiment because all of these photos that you're seeing of a body except for the ones of my grandmother and my, I mean, my mother and my godmother, it's me transformed. And most of the time you can't even tell that it's the same body. And I'm embodying deities, such water deities to be specific, that do transform and, trans and shape shift with within the diaspora. So it's amazing how you could go to a place like Brazil or you could go to a place like New York or Argentina and all of these different places and find the involvement of various African spiritual traditions, another way of departure and living through, you know, this, this DNA that lives, the information and intelligence that lives in the body. Interestingly enough, when I was in Argentina, I had the um, opportunity to go and show the cleanse, and it was imperative that I made work there because Argentina is a space that, um, you know, government from the government has constantly said, you know, um, Black, there's no African history and denounced its African heritage. When in fact, the main dance, the tango, the, the you know, is African. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so Condom Bay, I'm not sure what's happening. Condom Bay is, um, is it's transformed into the tango. And tango actually is um, evoking shango, which is the drumming. And if you think about the form of the tango, it's definitely, <laughs> you think about the drum. So for me, it was important to embody myself in a known Argentine garb, this blue dress and just claim space. And so I'm thinking about the idea of these evolving bodies claiming spaces in these spaces that persist on denying them. So it's this strong presence. In the face of history is also, I'm thinking about the document and history and how the more we know, if I go back to my original, the quote that we opened with, how the more that you know and the more that we can interpret and think about history in different ways, it really informs who we are. So on this process, I, I started this project really just as a, a screen printing experiment. I wanted to know what would happen if I screen print images on the document, what would that do? And when I look at it, I could, the fact that you can see the document through the body and it almost feels like one, it made me think about this idea of the metaphysical body and what it means to be in the past, present and the future at the same time. These documents are quite, important as they both point to Marcus Garvey's um, initiative, the Black Star Line, which was um, in the late 1800s where he wanted to trade across the diaspora um, between Black people because everyone else in America, the Irish, different people had their own trading. And he said, why can't we do it too? But you think about something you, just a few, like 20 years or so after slavery and to something that um, ambitious. So if you look at these documents, you have, there was an office in Ghana, an office in London and an office in New York. And this idea of traveling through the Mediterranean, the U USA and Canada and West Africa, such a powerful voyage that was shut down by, the, um, by America. Here is the, the um, uh, example of this exhibit and the, the, the amount of documents that I did explore for it. And it, when you enter the space, you're so overwhelmed with all of this knowledge, which is what history is, it's quite overwhelming. And, but what was really interesting is that when people experienced it, they were, they were really, they really walked up close to each document and spent a lot of time engaging with the documents and were really surprised by some of the things that they found. 
it was really my pleasure to take this project to Ghana and express it in a different way. So this, this was actually in a fort, the Usha fort, which was used as a place where enslaved people were traded. And so it was important to ha now have these historical documents and the cleanse viewed in this space. And in this space, we had over 10,000 people who engaged with it. And these were just regular everyday people who had tons of questions and were highly engaged in the exhibition. Now this leads me to, the, there's so many different iterations of In the Face of History. So during the onset, well, be right before the, the pandemic, I was commissioned to participate in the 100 Years, 100 Women exhibition, which um, celebrated the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So I was really interested in the role that African-American women played in, you know, in fighting for the rights for women to, to vote. So initially I was going to make a, um, a cape, another cape, a, a quilt of all of these documents on fabric, because I thought about what does it mean? I thought about um, the domestic space. I thought about the woven fabric and the, the transformation of cotton when, and that significance in history. So I started printing these documents on cotton paper, I mean, on cotton fabric. And some of the different documents that I came across were, um, you know, Hallie Quinn Brown, who was definitely an activist. And we, how many of us, you know, hear her name when we think about the woman fighting for the rights to vote? And um, Margaret Murray Washington, who was Booker T. Washington's wife, Ma uh, Miss Mary Church Ter Terrell. Here's a letter between the two of them being activists during their time. And this letter is dated 1924. So I started stamping again on all of these different. Um, documents and then printing out little squares of them. But then came the pandemic and we were told that we would not be exhibiting anymore. So, and we had to create this in a digital, for a digital space. So I thought, okay, well maybe I could do a performance and a video and slowly over time, really interesting is that this project formed over a long, over about a good two months. And during that month, it was pandemic you know, the hit of the pandemic in March. And I'm like, okay, what am I gonna do for this project? And I started thinking, okay, we'll be a cape. I'll make a cape because I thought about capes as something that protects us and it'll be a freedom cape, right? And we'll be protected by all of these amazing women throughout history. But then, um, and I thought I will videotape myself doing that. But then of course, after that, the, the social unrest and George Floyd, all of these things were happening. And as that was happening, the project just became more and more relevant. So I created this video and I'm gonna show you a snippet of it. You, it's about seven minutes long, but this is a very short version of it. As, as, as much as you know, it is about go vote, it is about disrupting and dismantling every system that has built in this country on white supremacy that oppresses us, which includes our democratic process. Um, the realities that we face is that this is the system that's in place. What's the alternative for us in our communities if we don't vote? We need to disrupt the system. So, but my question is, can we disrupt the system from inside? Is it one or the other? Is it voting or disrupting the system? Or do we um, encourage people to vote as we're finding ways to dismantle or disrupt systemic racism? So how do we actually break out of these systems that we have been sort of sequestered into the last several hundred years beyond, you know, just us being black people, us being black women as people in this country. What what is the new thing? Because obviously what we have is not working. The fact that the streets are on fire across the country is obviously, you know, speaking to that. And so it's not enough to just go vote as is, but how can we reimagine and rebuild the democracy that includes us as full citizens and not only three, four? How do we do something else. What is the new thing? What are the new systems that we can build? How are we exploring a beloved community and a visionary future where we are not just surviving, but we are thriving? Like where we are not on defense, but we are telling people what we want and then we get it. So I partnered with an organization called A Thousand Women Strong and they use this um, in, in around October as they were trying to empower people to vote. Here are some stills or just photos of the Cape.
And this brings me to another project. I feel like I was multitasking during the pandemic, during this height of the pandemic. I had all of these deliver deliverables and they were a way for me to meditate in the work. It was, I, I feel like this work actually, you know, maintained some of my sanity because I was dealing with these issues that I've been dealing, thinking about for so many years and they just became amplified as we were living through a pandemic and living through, uh, you know, when social injustice was right in front of our faces. Um, so I was I was commissioned to do a exhibition that was in conversation with the philosopher Anton Willem Amo. And many people don't know him, but he was a significant philosopher during the 1700s in Germany. And um, so we were invited to go to the space to Braunschweig where he was born, well, where he was actually sold or given as a gift to the Duke of Braunschweig. And he um, was educated there and then was elevated to this, you know, this very um, prestigious position. His research was really about this idea of the mind and the mind being an immaterial substance which um, lived on its own and did not have sensing. He said that the body sensed and the mind was kind of this big spirit, so to speak, right? And when the mind and body comes together, that's when the body is allowed to sense. So I thought about this idea of our physical bodies, but also the body of the earth. And what does it mean to sense, right? And with my work, I'm really, especially with my videos, I'm really interested in how people perceive it in terms, not so much in terms of how they interpret it, but what it makes them feel. So with this project, what I did is I did some research and I found, um, I, I came into some documents that were talking about when Audre Lorde visited Germany and she was in conversation with many women about civil rights there and the rights of women. And there was a young poet, her name was Mei Ayim. So I was able to sample her words in Germany alongside Audre Lorde's um, work for the audio track. And then again, here I am sampling images of life of the body, this body of earth movement and, and movement and juxtaposing all of that together to get this, this video, which I call Sun Sun in Mind. There's Sun Sun in Mind, Body and Spirit. And it's a three, it's an installation that is actually up in Berlin right now because it moved from Braunschweig to Berlin. And what's interesting is because of this exhibition, Anton Willem Amo, who we all didn't know at the time, now they've named the street sign after him in Berlin to recognize this man who has been so significant, not not only to the knowledge of Germany through those philosophers, but also um, to world history. But here's a snippet of the video. I want to be African, even if I want to be Dutch. And I want to be Dutch, even if I want to be Dutch. shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial, alone, coming and going in the hours between dawn, looking inward and outward at once, before and after, seeking nows. For those of us who live at the shoreline, for those of us standing live upon at the, the shoreline, edges of decision, upon the constant edges of decision, upon the crucial edges of decision, coming and going in the hours between dawn, coming and going in the hours between dawn, and looking inward and outward, seeking now, inward and outward, seeking now. For time's sake, I'll stop here. But then also I had, I made a book and this book is also representative of that movement and the journey.
and almost done. <laughs> So in the city, this is the third project that I was working on mid um, pandemic. And so um, I was so excited about this project. It, I was invited to create work for the exhibition Enunciated Life curated by Taylor Renee Ulrich, who's an, a magnificent, magnificent um, curator. And so she was looking at the um, Pentecostal church. And, you know, as soon as she said that, I was like, oh my goodness, yes, because the African spirit definitely lives in that space. So I'm going to show you a little snippet of this piece that I call She Caught the Holy Ghost. And it looked like this. This is my imagination of what it might look like and feel like to be on that journey. God Almighty, God. This video is normally six minutes, but again, for the sake of time. And here are some works in progress. I feel like this is a conversation between myself and my grandma Adama. So what I've done is I um, cyanotyped, I use the cyanotype process to make prints of patterns that I made in communication with patterns that my um, grandmother made. And so they're kind of layered over each other. And I printed them on fabric, on Guinea brocade fabric, which is the fabric that, that you know, in the tradition of people dying on that fabric. And then from those, like what I did is then I scanned in the material and then remade. So there's this kind of, again, repetition, taking the original form, scanning it, scanning it in, printing it on something tactile, scanning that in and then making new. Here's my, a new way of language making here. And these are still works in pro um, progress. And I'll leave you with a quote that I feel is quite relevant. Thus unlearning is not shying away or chickening out of reality, but pointing at deconstructing and complexifying those myths and longings of the nation state, the supreme race and the other fabulations. Unlearning is not forgetting. It is not deletion, cancellation, nor burning off. It is writing bolder and writing anew. It is commenting and questioning. It is giving new footnotes to old and other narratives. It is the wiping off of the dust, clearing of the grass and cracking off the plaster that lays above the erased. Unlearning is flipping the coin and awakening the ghost. Unlearning is looking in the mirror and seeing the world rather than a concept of universalism that indeed purports hegemony of knowledge. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
Adama, uh, Delphine, that was amazing. Now I'm calling you Adama after you guys. <laughs> it's fine. I'm known by both names. It's perfectly. My mama calls me Adama and everyone in my neighborhood calls me Adama. So it's fine. <laughs> um, that was incredible. I uh, am really glad that it's recorded because I need to rewatch um, because it went by very fast and you just brought so much into the room and the space. Um, I'm stunned. So congratulations on all of the new work. Um, I would love for people to um, either ask questions in the chat, I'd be happy to read, or you can unmute or raise your hand maybe, and I'll unmute you um, to make sure that it's sort of organized. Um, what, are, what are the questions out there? We, we've seen so much. I'm Lots of love. <laughs> Um, I do have a, I do have some technical questions, mostly about the videos. Um, okay. And I want to know, like outside of the Brooklyn Museum, what was the sound like? Because the sound was incredible and it was public outside. So how did they work that? It was actually incredible. I was really worried about that too, but they, the speaker system was so good that if you're familiar with the Brooklyn Museum, as long as you were sitting on the stairs, you could hear it just fine. I was like, I was really blown away at how great they were able to execute that. That's great. Cool. Um, yeah. Any questions out there? Lots of love still. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, what, the, it, it all belongs on, I mean, the, the work is, is, is just a continuation and a layering of, of the same, not the same, but like exploration of the themes, the main themes of the work. Um, and it's all housed in the space of the ISIS and the, and the, you know, the title of the talk. Um, I'm just curious to like, yeah, it's a continuation. Is that, is that the way it's working? It is. It's interesting because they do take on their different forms. Like, um, you know, sometimes I have a commission, you know, like the, the, for example, someone comes to me and says, for example, for the, she caught the Holy ghost. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the same thing, but I have a different way of saying it. So it's not necessarily, that, that piece doesn't necessarily fall under the sacred star of Isis, but as you can see, it's, it's the same sentiment, you know? So I find myself just really intuitively making and um, collecting and using my own archive in order to make, you know, new works because I feel like the archive is this creation of an archive. And then I'm constantly dipping into that archive to regenerate ideas. So even for example, the in the face of history, right? You see that transforming into so many different things. Who knew it was gonna be a cape? I had absolutely no idea. And, but I like the idea of using, of reusing and, and um, evolving, so to speak, these, this archive because the archive is, considered in my view the collective conscious or the collective unconscious right or that ancestral knowledge and so I find myself tapping into that ancestral knowledge in order to create and recreate and live and evolve and persist and tap into that potential. I mean, uh, Layla's here. Hi, Layla. Hi, Layla. <laughs> yeah. Question. I just want to say also the way that you install things I feel like you embrace and you hold mm -hmm. um i was uh, it was really incredible to see the installations because i feel like the audience is held in that space and um it was it was really beautiful to see layla asked i'm interested in the materials that you've gathered how do you determine what items you pick up when you travel that's a really good question you know sometimes my spirit just gravitates to things because i i, I immediately think about being in um, argentina and not having any idea you know i didn't grab anything to take with me to perform there because i i i, I feel like i'm embo embodying these spirits and then i perform right and then i just happen to find a thrift shop that I happened to see this dress. And remember in the beginning when I told you this serendipity, serendipitous nature of my work, this is how it happens. And so sometimes I'm actually looking for things. For example, when I went to Sierra Leone, I wanted to get cowrie shells that were from there. So I found myself looking for a bunch. I'm like, I'm there. So the, the, my go-tos are fabrics that are um, batik, similar to the same fashion that my grandmother made. I'm constantly looking for shells and things that relate and symbolize the water and hair I collect my own hair <laughs> I have jars of my own hair and they make them their ways into the work as well because if you notice I'm actually getting into this 
I'm making with my hands. So I'm stitching into fabrics and, you know, doing all of these things that really tend to break this frame of what we consider to be a photograph because I, I sim the photograph to me is a symbol of identity. And I feel like the more that I could complicate that identity, the more we could kind of maybe see how our com um, identities are so complex. Like we can't just look at a person and say, this is what you are, and then have a whole thing to, to attach to them, to project on them. And I feel like if we can, if we, begin to take people as individuals who are so complex and so rich with knowledge and ancestry and we appreciate that for each individual person how amazing would that be right but we live in the society that's so used to both you know grouping people together and calling them this and i feel like that's an easy way to oppress so i'm trying to think about imagine what happens when we break out of those barriers we have lots of questions now. Daniel, can you unmute yourself and then ask your question, please? Yes, I was interested uh, in what she said at the beginning, as a photographer, she thinks as a writer first. So mm -hmm. I guess in many ways, uh, when you're pulling together the ideas that you're expressing visually, you're taking it from what you read, uh, what you what you read and making connections in that manner? Is that? Something like that. You know what, what happens to me? Um, sometimes I'll be thinking and I'll be grappling with these ideas for years. And then I'll pick up a book and it explains this thing to me so clearly. And that's where I just get so excited. I'm like, okay, I have to make something. And that's exactly how it happens. So for example, even with Sylvia Arden Boone's work, I'm just reading it like, oh my gosh, yes, this is exactly what I thought, you know? So it's almost like these writers are communicating with me and, and saying, you're not, you're not crazy. Like, yeah, this is the theory right here. You know, even with Michael Gomez, the same thing, you know, these ideas that I've been thinking about and thinking about and thinking about, I'm like, yes, here it is. This is exactly what, you know, what I was trying to say. So I think that's what it is. And then also when it comes to writers and um, performers, something about Nina Simone, even though like some of the songs she's singing over, but something about the way she makes you feel when she opens her mouth and sings. There's so much knowledge and history just in her voice, and that inspires me. I'm also inspired by um, historical fiction. So when we think about Zorro Neale Hurston, the, what they're tapping into, you know, how Zorro Neale Hurston is writing in this Black African language, all of the, you know, that is so important to me. And that is, uh, it shows that evolvement. It shows a different levels, level of intelligence, you know? And that making to me, what is almost like mark making, that's what inspires me. So when, when I feel, it's like a thing that you feel and then it's, it, it just inspires me to make. So basically you're running the idea around in your head. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you read something and boom. Yep. Um, uh, ask Layla how like I feel about I, writing. I'm, yeah, like I'm afraid to write. <laughs> no, it, it really I'm afraid to write. Nothing wrong with it, man. But I'll make. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you are writing, but it's visual. Yes, That's I'm cool. writing visually. As long as I can write visually. <laughs> You're a storyteller. Great. Great. Absolutely. Let's get to let's get to um, some more questions. Uh, Lola. So glad you're here. Lola writes, I love the intense connections between writers and literature. Are, are there visual artists who inspire you? Oh, tons of our um, visual artists. You inspire me, Lola, Layla, Salima, all of y'all inspire me. Russell, Russell um, I have been, I fall in love with Carrie Mae Weems over and over and over again. You know, she actually, to be quite honest, the idea to make a video art was inspired by going to visit Carrie Mae Weems retrospect at the Guggenheim. I stared and stared at this video of her just walking in this white dress all gracefully. And I said to myself at that moment, even though it was like maybe two years later that I actually did something, that I was going to make a slow motion video. I didn't know what it was gonna be, but that it was just something again, it was something about how the way the video made you feel. And that really inspired me to, um, you know, to just to push a little bit and say, well, what would happen if I made a video, you know? And I, I, I and it's interesting because even though I had that thought back then, 
when I thought I was going to make a video, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do something, you know, because it, it was, I had to remember that that was a connection, you know? Wow. Ngozi writes, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your process? Because you were working on multiple projects during the a pandemic at that. I know for creatives and people in general, it can be hard to be motivated and be inspired when you're dealing with the stress and life in general. How were you able to be so productive and focused during the pandemic? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be quite honest with you. I was really scared because in March and April, there were days when my bed is where I spent 90% of my time. And I'm like, wait, I have this thing to do. But you know what it is? In those down times, my head is spinning. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to approach this video? And what I've learned, right, is that if I go straight to it, it's not going to come out right. Like I'm going to force myself to do it. So at some moment, something hits me and it's like, okay, you got to, you got to go sit down and do it. And then that's when it gets done. It's like, it's like how, because a lot of the times, honestly, I don't know what the end product is going to be. I just know I'm doing a video. I know that I'm using these samples, but I'm still playing around with the voice. Like, for example, I didn't know I was going to use Mahalia Jackson. I was searching and searching. I'm like, I need a voice. Like I need a voice to take me through this whole process of this Holy Ghost. And I was searching and I said, you know, maybe Mahalia Jackson, because she has that voice. But when I came across that, I was like, yes, this is what it is. So it was kind of this process of the excitement of seeing what the finished product is gonna be and not even knowing what it's gonna be that drives me and a deadline. I work very well close to deadlines. <laughs> I work very good under pressure. But just to give you an example, when I did my, um, when I did my thesis at Columbia University, that, 2018, I, I think I was working with a um, clone or something like that because I had a thesis that had to get done. I um, released along with Layla Umfun, women photographers of the African <laughs> diaspora. And to add icing, icing on the cake, I had two sons, one that was graduating from high school who needed to go into a good high school. And if you know anything about New York City public education, that is not an easy thing to do. And another son who was going into conservatory, which is also not an easy thing to do. And because I'm a hands-on mom, all of those things happened around the same time <laughs> in 2018. So I am a natural multitasker. Maybe the excitement of pressure puts me to work, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. I shake my head too. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we met that year too. And it was, yes. I didn't have, I didn't have a good concept of how dizzying your schedule was, but now I do. I get mm -hmm. it now. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I hesitate to say this lovely Turkish name, um, but uh, it's, is it Gul? Um, it's delightful work. Thank you. I noticed that there are themes of water in your videos. Any relationships with you and memories? What's the water mean to you? Yes, water found its way in my work. So interesting. Like I didn't know that it was in my work until after I started looking at it. And so the cleanse was actually the first sense of physical water, right? But then I went to Sierra Leone and I had this um, dress that was with me for many years. It's another dress that my grandmother hand dyed and she sent the fabric and, you know, I had this dress from since the 90s right? It's old. The dress is older than all of my kids. And here I am. I'm like, I'm going to bring this dress with me to do something with it in Sierra Leone. And as I got there, I was in Bo, which is like, I, I traveled from Freetown to Bo to Pujon, where my grandmother was born. So when I was at the midpoint at my um, grand aunt's house, I spread out the dress and I looked at it. And for the first time, or maybe my first, this time is, I probably realized this before, but as I told you, this dress is really old. It was a it was a mommy water dress. It was a part woman, part um, um, fish, and it had water everywhere. Hmm. And I was like, wow. And then in the same breath, my I was traveling to a place called Mano, where my where the Fawundus come from. And Mano is a three hour boat ride from the shores of Pujong. So I knew I was going to take this journey on water. And my cousin said to me, she said, you know, she's explaining this to me. You know, when you're about to do something and you're not sure exactly what you're about to do in a place that you've never been to before. Because when I go to, to Sierra Leone, I'm usually in the city, but 
to give you an example, Bo and is is three hours away from Freetown, and Pujon is another is like six hours away from like about four hours away from Bo. This is a long journey. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to imagine something that I have no idea. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna be on a boat. What does that boat look like now? Come to find out this was literally like a, a fisher boat, you know, a fisherman boat, right? Not that like maybe eight, maybe like 10 feet long and like six feet wide, three hours on the river. And my cousin said to me, she said, you know what? She said, have no fear. We're crim women and crim women do not fear water. And I got goosebumps. I was like, oh my God, wow. You know, and at that point, it made sense to me. I was like, water, yes. And then the more I think about it, I think about just water and these bodies of water and what they mean in history. I think about our bodies and how we're made up of water. And 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 there's so much, like even the book that I showed, Sun Sum, that I showed at Braunschweig, um, I was thinking about the sea as history. And again, now I start to think about these poems and these texts that reference water that gives it so many layers of meaning, you know, that just bringing to light these um, different ideas. And most recently, um, and even we could relate this to the first quote about opening your eyes and seeing, I've been thinking about our waters that are surrounding us in our cities, you know? So thinking about New York and the Hudson River and how we need to be cognizant of this water that's around us and need to care for the water unless we will not be here. You know what I mean? And so my recent work is really being coming even more aware of the immediate, our immediate water surroundings and what it means to keep that water, you know, clean and safe for us. So yeah, so it's like there's several, several meanings with water that um, Every as 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 life goes on, it takes on newer, new, you know, new meanings for me and very important meanings. Well, uh, I want to respect everyone's time here. We try to keep it to an hour. Um, thank you all for coming, uh, Delphine. This was just an astounding hour. Um, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Yes, I appreciate all of you being here, and I see all these people. Yay! <laughs> please, please join us next week. We have a conversation between Ephraim Zolani Mendel and Eileen Ray Walsh. Um, and they're going to be talking about the artist process and some of the some of the um, intricate conversations we have with ourselves. So please come back. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Delphine. What a great time. night. It was such a great talk. Thank you. Hey, Jules. Oh, all my Kamoinge family. And LaSalle. <laughs> My friend from since I was, what, 12? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Thank you.